You're the leading organization that's doing this. You have chapters all over the country and other organizations are following your lead. What is the expertise that you have and other Moms for Liberty advocates have to decide that a book, an award winning book like All Boys Aren't Blue isn't appropriate for students to read? When I was preparing for this conversation, of course, I did the Google search Moms for Liberty. The first thing that comes up is images of Nazis burning books and saying Moms for Liberty is a hate group that wants to ban books. So many people just don't seem to understand uh, the graphic, explicit sexual content um, that is in a lot of these books. And so the question becomes, why is it not okay to read the content at a school board meeting or to show it on TV, but it is okay uh, for a public school library? The time is now to take a step back and say, what is going on? Why do we have these children in school for eight hours a day or more, and they are not being given the basic skills and knowledge necessary to be successful in life, reading, writing, and doing math? Why is the focus on all of this other garbage? And the only way that public schools are going to change is if parents get involved and change them. Am I hopeful? I, yeah, I have to be hopeful. I have four children. You show me the mom who gives up on her kids when the going gets tough. Welcome to Loopcast. My guest today is Tiffany Justice. What a perfect name for what you do. Tiffany is a wife and mom of four school-aged children. And in 2016, she stepped up to serve for four years on the school district of Indian River County, Florida School Board. So she's not asking you to do anything she hasn't done herself. And she believes that kids in public schools deserve innovation, amen, and parents have the right to know the union interference and government bureaucracy that is keeping that innovation from happening in their children's education. So big fan of yours, Tiffany, fan of the work that you're doing with Moms for Liberty, and it's a pleasure to have you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I wrote that bio when we first started Moms for Liberty three years ago, and it's um, very, very true today. Yeah, it's definitely an evergreen source of inspiration. Uh, the problem has not gone away. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, as we as we have our conversation. I'd like to break this down. And I, I know you talked about before we started, but I have three categories. I want to talk boards, books, and beginnings with you. And uh, we're well, starting with school boards because this is something here at Catholic Vote we are always, uh, you know, encouraging our listeners to get involved in their local politics and make a change. And it's been one of the the top pushes with Moms for Liberty. Um, so in 2023, you had some real success in replacing corrupt school boards. If, if you could just tell us a little bit about you've been active for three years. How has it been going in terms of taking back our school boards for our kids? So as you said, I ran for school board in 2016. I had four children in the public school system at the time. Um, and, and I had no idea how important school board actually was. Before I ran for school board, I didn't even know who my old school board members are. I'm a little ashamed to say that. But I really wasn't a political person. Um, I wasn't involved in politics in any way. And so um, when I, I, I saw that there was a gentleman running for school board for my district who was 22 years old, and here I was, a mom of four, actively involved in, in volunteering at my children's school. I said, well, maybe this is, this is something that needs to happen. Maybe we need more people who are busy, you know, living their lives, running businesses, raising their families, right? But maybe some of us need to take a step back and say, well, how are we going to prioritize our country and our, our local community going forward? And serving an elected office is, um, I think, the most important thing that you can do right now in America, um, all politics is local, to be honest with you. And so um, we encourage people to run for school board in 2022. So we were founded in 2021. In 2022 is the first year that we uh, started helping our chapters to endorse in school board. To be clear, the chapters are the ones who endorse in the local races. It's not the National Moms for Liberty organization. We gave them the, the resources, the tools, the information, support. Uh, we also have started a, a super PAC where we go in and we try to do some advertising and some support of candidates uh, in that way. But it's the chapter that does the endorsing. And uh, so in 2022, we endorsed in over 500 school board races, uh, one over half of those. 76% of the candidates that had uh, we endorsed had never run for office before. That's the wow. uh, statistic. Yeah, that's the statistic that means really the most to me, honestly. Um, and then in 2023, we endorsed 
Um, in a little over 100 races, our, our success rate overall in 2023 was about 43%. Um, interesting because on cycle elections, uh, you have more people coming out to vote. The the elections where you have that, you know, they're, they're offshoots, right? Maybe they're in May, maybe they're in March, maybe they're in the fall. Right. Um, and there aren't a lot of other big ticket, you know, races on the ballot. Uh, the unions have really run the game on those elections. They, they are able to communicate with their membership, right? They have that direct membership uh, communication that they keep up all throughout the year. And so getting people out to vote and to vote for the candidates that the union wants isn't something difficult for them. They've been doing it for a long time. Um, they like to try to give us a hard time uh, that we only won 43 percent of the races we endorsed in. Um, I think that's funny. Uh, we won, you know, more than we would have if we hadn't been involved. And I think they're actually really exactly. scared <laughs> uh, at the amount of influence. Yeah. And th the last thing I'll say is um, in 2023, 83 percent of the candidates that we endorsed had never run or served in local office before. So um, to me, that means that we are engaging a whole new group of people into politics and getting involved in their community. And that uh, that's what winning looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you've really tapped into sort of the sleeping giant, the sleeping mama bear probably is a better way of putting it. But and I, I think they are running scared because instead of winning 100 percent, they won, you know, less than 60 percent, less than 70 percent. Um, so when I think this is really interesting to you about this sort of massive rookie class of school board members or people getting involved in politics. So when you talk to uh, first time candidates, these moms and dads who are running, what's your number one advice for them? To do their homework, uh, to really get to know the policy that's happening in their district, to uh, use all of the resources around them, friends, neighbors, other people uh, that have been involved in business in lots of different ways to come in and help them as resources so they can dig into that budget, right? If you are a business person, but you've got a friend who's an accountant and they're willing to sit down with you and go through the budget with a fine tooth comb and help you to ask the right questions and to follow the money, uh, that's really, really great. And so my best advice is, you know, you're not alone. Uh, that's why Moms for Liberty. So not only do we help to find candidates and vet those candidates and then endorse them and help the community know who to vote for, we're also building an army on the ground to support those candidates once they get elected into office. One of the things that I saw when I was on school board was the fact that the union comes out in force. They come out with red shirts on. Um, and there, there are many of them who come to the meetings. And I remember going into meetings regarding bargaining or different things where I thought that I had a pretty good idea of where the other school board members that I served with stood on issues. But they would flip on a dime. Literally, uh, you, you would see a change happen and the vote would change in that moment because no one was standing on the other side of these issues, right? Um, wow. I remember there was an early release day that we had in my, in my county. Uh, that uh, was really bad for families. Um, it was really hard for parents once a month, uh, every once, once, one Wednesday a month, excuse me, uh, schools uh, shut down half day um, and the teachers would have professional development. And the feedback from the teachers was that the professional development that they were getting wasn't very useful. And the feedback from the parents was that it was very difficult for them to figure out what to do with their kids one day a month uh, when every other child was also not in school, because most parents have a job, right? They're working, right? Um, especially for our single moms, incredibly difficult. And um, the feedback from what we saw with attendance and the kids was that a lot of kids would just skip. It was a it was a meaningless day where a lot wasn't done. And so, um, you know, every minute you have a child in the classroom is an important minute to use. Um, and uh, but it took me a ton of money. And a ton of uh, perseverance to get rid of these early release days, which we, um, in the end, did uh, get rid of them. But, you know, I remember a vote on that where um, the union didn't want to let go of the, the early release day. It was, it was worth a lot of money and bargaining to them. And, and unfortunately, other school board members were swayed by that, that influence, right? You get change thrown at you by a union member. Um, and that's happened to me. Uh, I have had change thrown at me on the dais. Um, you know, that, that kind Lovely. of affects your psyche, I guess, a little. Yeah. Well. Right, right. Well, you must have a, a steel spine because I can't imagine some of this. <laughs> so I just, I want to dig into that union dynamic a little bit more. I think those of us who have chosen alternative education for our kids, it's hard for us to grasp how powerful these unions are. 
And for me, I look at a situation like what you just described, and here you have the teachers are saying these early release days are ridiculous. Um, And I think of the COVID shutdowns, too. The teachers are saying this is bad for the kids. The parents are saying this is bad for our families and for the kids. And even the kids are saying this is a waste of our time. So who are the unions actually advocating for? American teachers unions are the foot soldiers of the progressive far left. Make no mistake about it. Ninety nine percent of the donations uh, from teachers unions go to Democrats. Uh, It's a very uh, important support line uh, for them. Uh, And, um, you know, there was talk about if President Biden uh, didn't, in fact, run again, who would the next uh, Democrat uh, nominee be? Uh, Gavin Newsom has been discussed, but the other person that's been discussed is J.B. Pritzker um, out of Illinois. And he has been a huge proponent of uh, public unions. Yeah. And so um, the unions have incredible uh, political influence. Um, I, I think we can all remember the very cozy picture of Joe Biden with his arm around Randy Weingarten, right? Just having a good old unforgettable time. first day, <laughs> first day in office. Jill Biden, Joe Biden have Randy Weingarten there. We we got to see uh, Randy Weingarten in communication with the head of the CDC, Rochelle Walensky, during COVID, keeping our children's schools closed, having conversations back, you know, backroom conversations, and then we see the National School Board Association working. Um, in conjunction with the teachers unions and, and, the, Se- and the Department of Education uh, to really label parents domestic terrorists. Um, they do not want parents to have their voices heard. And the truth is, the reason why they don't want parents to have their voices heard is because parents are calling out the failure in American public schools. Parents are waving the flag and saying, wait a second, why are the vast majority of children in American public schools not reading on grade level. And uh, Randy Weingarten, Becky Pringle, they don't want to answer that question, but American parents are not going to stop asking. Yeah, absolutely. So with these ties to the Democratic Party, just to kind of round out our discussion of the taking back the school boards, are you primarily seeing this as a red state phenomenon? Is there any kind of movement in the deep blue states? I'm in Connecticut, so I care a lot. Um, so, you know, you're in Florida. We think of that as sort of ground zero for the take, take back of our institutions. Um, are you seeing this as primarily a, a red state fight right now? No, I, I, I'm not. I mean, I think we saw red state, blue state as far as reopening was concerned and school reopenings. And that was came to be very clear because of the leadership. But when you look at school districts on the ground, when you really get down into the district, right, um, it doesn't matter whether you have a red or a blue state or you have a red or a blue county. Um, it really doesn't matter. The majority of people that are serving on school boards across the United States have been working in service of the teachers unions. Mm, That's really encouraging, actually. (laughs) I mean, it sounds dark, but that's encouraging to hear that it's happening. Yeah, it means that change. Well, it also means that change can happen quickly. It means that you don't have to wait for these larger elections that you can actually make a change happen in your own community by changing your school board. Yeah. And then for, again, a lot of the people who listen in on this podcast have their kids in Catholic schools or have their kids in homeschooling situations or other other uh, modes of education. So we, you know, I think the tendency can be to look at what Moms for Liberty is doing and be like, well, that's nice because they send their kids to public schools or something. Um, But it's not for me because I'm building my own alternative reality out here. What would you say to parents who have that mentality that I don't need to get involved in local politics because I'm just kind of building my own reality over here? Is this for everyone to get involved in? Yeah, I mean, your children are going to graduate from whatever school that they're in or, or, or finish homeschooling with you, and then they're going to go out into the world. And you, I guess you would think, want them to have, you know, relationships, families, marriage, uh, be able to work um, and, and be able to create a life for their family and their children. And the truth of the matter is that uh, our American public education system is completely captured, uh, much like our media is, much like we see with our higher ed institutions, completely captured institutions, our libraries, for example, as well. And so um, the fight is here at our doorstep. And I believe that there are a lot of different things that need to happen in order to help America to move forward. Closing our borders is one of those. Ending global influence by the UN and UNESCO is another one of those. But the truth of the matter is that it doesn't matter what else we do. If we do not reclaim and reform our public education system, um, uh, this country will not continue. There is no future in a nation where the majority of children cannot read, write, or do math. 
Wow. Well said. So turning to those libraries, again, this is another area I think where Catholic Votes efforts are Hide the Pride campaign we do every year um, really kind of crosses over. And when I was preparing for this conversation, of course, I did the Google search, Moms for Liberty. The first thing that comes up is images of Nazis burning books and saying Moms for Liberty is a hate group that wants to ban books because you also have an effort to get these books out of children's sections in libraries. So I would like to just hear from you. What is what is the Moms for Liberty book list that everyone screams at and runs around like their heads are cut off? And what's the goal of the effort to get these books out of the hands of our kids? Yeah. So first of all, I want to say that uh, no one wants to ban books. Moms for Liberty is not interested in banning books. You should write the book, print the book, Fake publish news, the book, everyone. sell the book. Yeah. Put the book in your public public library if you want. But when we're talking about public school, K through 12, public school, government schools, there are standards that are meant to be followed. Right. And and we don't children don't have unfettered access to the Internet at school. Uh, they don't they can't listen to any type of music that they want. They can't watch any movie that they want. Teachers can't just show a PG-13 movie in a classroom. And so this idea that the library is somehow different in any way, is just ridiculous. But Again, this has been used as a political bludgeon. President Biden put out a, a campaign video when he announced uh, his, his, uh, that he would be running again for office, and he talks about book banning. You see that the teachers' unions and a lot of former Obama admin that are members of PEN America or American Library Association um, are, are talking uh, about banning books. They want to scare people. That's what they do. They can't actually engage on the issues, so they fear monger. Uh, just a, a, of note, perhaps to your viewers, uh, the head of the American Library Association is a woman named Emily Drabinsky. Emily is a self-proclaimed Marxist, uh, just very excited about Marxism and, and excited about sharing that. And in 2013, I believe she wrote a paper called Queering the Catalog, which was about queering the library. And maybe sometime, Erica, you can have me on to talk a little bit about queer theory, which is the Q in LGBTQ, but very different uh, than the LGB part of 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 the movement. And, and to be clear, Moms for Liberty has a lot of different members. We have members who are religious. We have members who are not religious. Um, and the religions really span uh, across Muslim, Jewish, Catholic, uh, Mormon, Christian. I mean, really across the board, um, we have members who uh, from various different um, racial backgrounds. Uh, and we have members who are gay and we have members who have gay children. And so um, this idea that somehow we're looking to exclude anyone uh, or anyone's story from the library is just not accurate or true. Uh, the truth is that we believe in age-appropriate content. And uh, as I started with the movies and all of that, if you do a public record search right now, if you get out your computer and you email your school district, ask them, what websites do you not allow children to access when they are at school? And in that list of the websites that kids aren't allowed to access and the subject matter that they would be able to get uh, from those websites looks a lot like the content in the books that we're trying to have removed from libraries. And so it's not the sole mission. It's not even the primary mission of Moms for Liberty to address the book issue. But the book issue was so egregious. Um, and so many people just don't seem to understand uh, the graphic, explicit sexual content um, that is in a lot of these books. And so our moms just felt like it was a very... Um, easy and uh, and true and um, accessible to everyone way to show just the level of depravity that has that we've sunk to. Uh, and and I really um, it's not shocking that any parent would want to have a conversation with their own child about how a baby is made. And uh, any time that I have pulled out the books and I did so in a, a recent 60 minutes interview, which is yet to air. Um, and I read the content of the books and show the pictures of the books. Um, people are shocked. School board meetings uh, are being, you know, shut down because of the content being read. And so the question becomes, why is it not OK to read the content at a school board meeting or to show it on TV? But it is OK uh, for a public school library. And we all know that it's just a ridiculous, disingenuous conversation that's being used to further political wants and needs of adults. Yeah. And I think we've all seen those videos of the parents reading from these sexual, I mean, not even beyond sexually explicit, like bestial kind of content. And then the, the, the mic gets shut off and then the point is made. 
So I am, I'm going to bite. You, te- you gave me a little teaser there about queer theory. So what do you think is their justification or their, the people, librarians, school librarians who are pushing for these books, who are defending these books, what are they trying to protect and what exactly are they trying to get into our kids' minds? Why? Well, I mean, Marxists want destruction. Um, that's, that's really the name of the game. The issue is never the issue. The issue is all, always the revolution. Uh, Drag Queen Story Hour, for example, was written about in a, a paper uh, by uh, two people, including one drag queen uh, named Lil Miss Hot Mess. Uh, that is not a joke. That is real. And what they talked about was that Drag Queen Story Hour was an initiation point into queer theory in the public school classroom. They wanted to leave glitter in the carpet. And so um, this idea of queering things um, going as anything traditional or normal um, is about destruction and disruption and destabilization. Um, and uh, what's the point of it? You know, I think you have some ideologues. I think you do have some people that are dug in and that do believe that, you know, as Marx uh, would state, that we are trapped in this prison of our own making. Uh, Ferreri, who uh, is a Brazilian Marxist theologian, um, wrote two books, The Politics of Education and the Pedagogy of the Oppressed, that have been um, really influential in uh, the um, the uh, teaching of our teachers in, in colleges of education. And what they talk about and they focus on is not the idea of, of um, giving knowledge and information to students, but that the goal of education truly should be to awaken a critical consciousness in the child. And so we see that happening from the library to the math classroom, to the English language arts classroom, to the set- social studies classroom, to social emotional learning, which is now woven into every single aspect of your children's education in public schools, which is values clarification. Um, but it truly is this idea of entering in generative themes into the classroom in order to awaken a critical consciousness in the child. Um, and you don't need to look very farther, very much farther than Mao and the building of the Red Guard in, in China to see what's happening in America with this idea of a rainbow guard or a, a, as a, a green guard, a climate guard, um, that this idea that the youth will be used in order to change the future and transform the future of the country. Um, so right now in schools, our kids are being taught that our country is broken and evil and that their parents are stupid and bad. And uh, that has to stop. Yeah. And I think the family, of course, being the vanguard, the number one obstacle to queer theory and Marxist, the Marxist revolution. Black Lives Matter said in their original tenets, the disruption, they wanted the disruption of the nuclear family. Everyone should be asking why. I want to back it up a little bit and get the the genesis story of Moms for Liberty. I know that you're one of two co-founders. And like you said, this was coming out of COVID. So what for you really opened your eyes to the need to organize, as it were, I mean, not to use Marxist language, but <laughs> to organize and to get uh, Moms for Liberty off the ground. I get my best material from the left, right? Um, they're smart. They know how to organize people. I mean, Obama, Obama said he was a community organizer. People laughed at him, but it was true. And what do I see myself as now? A community organizer, honestly. I mean, it's so important. Um, Yeah. So again, I was serving on school board uh, in Indian River County, Tina Deskovich serving on school board in Brevard County, one county up from me. We didn't know each other, but we were being uniquely prepared for a journey um, to fight for the future of our country and to encourage other moms and dads to get involved and to fight as well. And so four years in that school board showed me a lot of different things. It showed me that we don't have a funding problem in, in American education. We have a priorities problem. Um, as I've stated before, the unions have an undue influence in your children's education. And truly, parents, uh, they don't really want us that involved. They'd like us not to ask too many questions. And when you do ask questions, if you dare to ask a question and you're wrong or you don't say it in the right way, uh, they are all too happy to tell you how silly and stupid you are and to tell you why they are the experts who should be teaching your children, not you. Uh, but every parent knows that's ridiculous. Every parent has the fundamental right to direct the upbringing of their children, their education, their medical care, their morality, and their religion. And that means every parent. That doesn't mean we get to stand in judgment of parents and say, well, I don't like this decision that you made, so I don't think you're as valid as a parent. I can't even imagine on school board if someone had come up uh, to the, the podium to speak and I was passing judgment on their lifestyle or their level of education. Um, or their uh, socioeconomic status. 
um, how that that's not what you are there to do as an elected official. And yet during COVID, I was seeing a lot of judgments being passed on parents. And I saw a system that um, really uh, cared a lot more about the wants of adults than the needs of kids. So Tina Deskovich, one county up from me, she recounts a story where she said someone came and said, I'm going to report you to the county commission, to her school board. And she sat there and thought to herself, the county commission has nothing to do with what we do here at this school board building. And so there was just a real disconnect. And during COVID, people wanted to understand where does the authority lie for the decisions that are being made that affect our family? So our mission statement and Moms for Liberty is to unify, educate, and empower parents to defend their parental rights at all levels of government. And that's what we have tried to do from the day that we started, January 1st, 2021. Uh, get parents a seat at the table, and then once they have that seat at the table, help them to be the most effective advocates possible. Yeah, and so it sounds a lot like COVID, and I think it comes up a lot that in the early days it was critical race theory and, and um, that sort of awakening of parents as they're watching their kids have these classes online that they're not teaching math. Like, why are why are they learning about uh, race wars and conflict in like fourth grade math class? Or my kid can't read. Uh, you know, the sort of wake up call for parents. In the past, uh, you know, now two three years of your existence, have you seen any kind of shift in the issues confronting parents? Has the left, you know, sort of corrected itself and moved its emphasis. And as a result, what's that meant for you, if anything? The issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. So it really doesn't matter about the specific issue, although there are issues that are harming children that we have to address head on. Um, things like critical race theory, things like uh, critical gender theory, right? Queer theory, what we're seeing with the gender ideology in the schools and across the United States of America, the sexual content in the books, the fact that the children are not learning to read in school. Um, so, no, I, I, the issues are, are still the same issues that we have been battling and dealing with. And uh, it's really critical theory, critical pedagogy that's been laced throughout uh, all of uh, our education system. Um, but when you look at issues like, um, we'll say, gender ideology for a moment, the idea that you have children uh, in schools as young as kindergarten. And yes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is in fact happening uh, where children are being taught uh, that they could be a boy or a girl or a boy or a girl, or maybe a tree that day if they feel like being a tree, um, or, or not a boy or a girl at all, right? Um, you're talking about undermining the very foundation of truth and the relationship between the parent and the child. Because, you know, if, if a school can convince a child who probably believes in Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy, so let's, you know, remember the mind of a child, very different than an adult, right? But if a school can convince a child that perhaps their parents were wrong about something very basic to them, um, that's the beginning of the destabilization. And it's truly what this is about. This is about driving a wedge between the parent and the child and uh, replacing the government uh, in the role of the parent uh, in the child's life. And, and schools are continuing and the unions are continuing to work to do that, Erica. Um, there's a program called Community Schools. Um, the CDC, and we all saw the influence of the CDC. And this is just a note, you know, if you're listening to me right now and you're saying, gosh, I'd love to get involved or I'd like to do research or I'm a little concerned about the future and where where this is all going. Um, again, this this program called Community Schools uh, run by the CDC, the whole school, whole child, whole community model. It sounds lovely, uh, the idea that we're going to have wraparound services for children. But if we allow our government schools to further become the parent and the caretaker of the child. We will further disengage American parents from their role in their child's life. And, and there is no, again, no future in that for America. America was built on family uh, and the idea of family. And so um, that's the breakdown. Uh, you ask me, have the issues changed? No, the, the issue is never the issue. The issue is always the revolution. That's a really good, it's an important lesson to remember. And these community schools, this whole rollout is, it seems to me, so particularly insidious because it does, it sounds, it's the, it's the use of euphemism. And, you know, we have an increasingly exhausted population with the inflation, with people having to work and take on extra jobs. So you think of the rise in single mother and you have this increasingly exhausted and therefore increasingly vulnerable adult families who they hear something like, well, 
you can just plug your kid into this community school and we'll take care of everything for you. And the temptation there is to say, you know what? I just can't take anymore. I'm just going to lay down. Sure. Take my kid. That sounds great. And they're like, oh, and your taxes pay for it. So you're, but I, I think it's so important for parents to make that extra effort and put the first things first and, and understand what's happening in our schools. So I'm glad you're bringing attention to that, that phenomenon because people are really vulnerable to it. Um, I, I always ask this question when I interview, you know, parents, activist parents uh, in education. Do you see hope for our public schools or for parents who are looking at this and listening to you right now? Do you have a more of a get out now message? I think if you can get your kids out and that's what you feel is best for them, that's what you need to do. Uh, you you will not find me standing at the uh, door of a burning schoolhouse telling you that you have to keep your child in that school. Um, so I support education freedom uh, without a doubt. Again, parents have the fundamental right to direct the education of their child. But what I know to be true is that public education is going to continue in the United States. And we are we are continuing to graduate students who do not have the skills and knowledge to unfold their full potential in life. And um, our kids deserve more. Our children deserve to learn to read. And we spend over $800 billion a year in local and federal state dollars, tax dollars on public education. If you had a business and two-thirds of your products failed, if you made seatbelts and two-thirds of your products failed to keep people safe in the car, would you get more money? Would we invest in your product or would we say, wow, let's take a step back here and see why are all of these seatbelts failing? And so the truth is that we have a public education system that is failing. I don't blame Randy Weingarten. Of course, she doesn't want to own the harm. They've been running the schools for forever. If there's systemic racism in public schools, well, we have the union to thank for that. That's just the truth. And so the time is now to take a step back and say, what is going on? Why do we have these children in school for eight hours a day or more, and they are not being given the basic skills and knowledge necessary to be successful in life, reading, writing, and doing math? Why is the focus on all of this other garbage? And the only way that public schools are going to change is if parents get involved and change them. And that means every parent, even if, you have, if you're homeschooling, even if you've got your kids in a private school, by the way, if your children are in a private school, they are not safe from all of this ideology. I speak to pri parents of children uh, who are in private school all of the time, including Catholic school, where social emotional learning and other things have seeped in and grabbed hold. And so you have to be vigilant as a, you have to be vigilant as a parent. Am I hopeful? I, yeah, I have to be hopeful. I have four children. You show me the mom who gives up on her kids when the going gets tough. I haven't met many moms who do that. You know, not every mom always knows the best way to fight um, and, and how to be effective, but that's why we're here. And so to anyone listening, we do not stand in judgment of you as a parent. If you have a parent, we're going to believe that you love that child and want the best for them. And we're going to be here to help you to be an effective advocate so you can make sure that they get the best education possible no matter where they go to school. Wonderful. So Moms for Liberty, if anyone wants to learn more, find a local chapter, momsforliberty.org. And we will definitely pop that in the show notes. There are 300 chapters. I think you're in every step, 48 states. Are you... 48, 48, 48 states. Yes. All right, 48, 48 in two years. That's impressive. <laughs> so you should be able to find them somewhere nearby. And I would encourage everyone to go and check it out because this really is the fight of our lives. And yes, we're tired, but it is our primary role in this life um, to make the best world we can for our kids. And I think that's something you're finding all Americans can get behind. This is really important battle. So uh, Tiffany Justice, thank you so much for joining us. It was really inspiring for me. And I hope all of our listeners feel the same way. 